The Battle of the Philippine Sea was the largest aircraft carrier battle in history. It took place on June 19th through 20th, 1944, during the Pacific War. Quote, the rise and fall of Imperial Japan depends on this one battle, Japanese Admiral Soemu Toyoda would write about the clash. After the U.S. amphibious invasion of the Mariana Islands, it became critical to secure the territory. Although controversial at first, Admiral Raymond Spruance's patient approach would eventually prove superior to the aggressive Japanese strategy. A combined 24 carriers and 1,350 carrier-based aircraft engaged in a decisive fight between the forces of the U.S. Navy's 5th Fleet and the Imperial Japanese Navy's mobile fleet. The 5th Fleet's defensive posture remained tethered to the islands for months after the battle ended. The American troops were finally at bombing distance to the Japanese mainland, a key maneuver that would prove crucial in the outcome of the war. Kantai Kesson. In December of 1941, the Imperial Japanese Army, driven by the nation's eager imperialism, began scheming an ambitious plan. Pearl Harbor was only the first phase of a strategy aimed at inflicting enough pain on U.S. troops to pursue a peace process that would allow Japan to keep its conquest in the Pacific. Admiral Minichi Koga began preparations for a decisive battle that was to take place in early 1944. However, Koga perished in a typhoon, and Commander-in-Chief of the Combined Fleet, Admiral Soemu Toyoda, was appointed to finalize the plans known as Operation Ago. On June 12, 1944, U.S. carriers carried out a forceful airstrike on the Mariana Islands as part of Operation Forager. The Americans caught the Japanese by surprise and unprepared to counterattack, with only 50 land-based aircraft to defend their position. After three days of airstrikes and surface bombardments, the American troops finally came ashore in Saipan. Toyota knew it was time to carry out Plan Ego and unleash Kantai Kesson, or Decisive Battle. This doctrine emerged when a well-trained but smaller Japanese navy defeated the Russian fleet at the beginning of the century. During previous battles in the Pacific Theater in 1942 and 1943, the Japanese lost most of their skilled pilots. This irreplaceable loss rendered their aircrew incapable of filling most carrier groups. Still, Admiral Toyota ordered a naval counterattack and sent almost all the Imperial Japanese Navy's standing carriers to battle. First Sightings Vice Admiral Jisaburo Ozawa commanded the Japanese First Mobile Fleet. Although their already fragmented air forces had been greatly reduced during the American attacks of the previous days, Ozawa was confident. Sheltered by an infallible plan and favored by the eastern trade winds, the Japanese were ready to start the battle. U.S. Fifth Fleet Commander Raymond Ames Spruance sensed an attack was imminent. On the afternoon of June 15th, two American submarines came across Japanese vessels and reported back to command. Close to midnight, the USS Kabala submarine caught sight of Ozawa's refueling convoy. As it was lining up a shot, a Japanese destroyer changed course towards it. The submarine submerged 75 feet as quickly as possible, and the warship passed directly above it. After surfacing, USS Kavala reported the encounter and was ordered to follow the convoy to locate a potential refueling rendezvous. The submarine tracked the convoy for three days and uncovered some of the Japanese fleet's position. The American crew was instructed to stand and were disappointed not to engage in battle. After consulting Admiral Chester Nimitz, Spruance directed Task Force 58 into the Philippine Sea to the west. Meanwhile, the 52nd was to support the invasion forces near Saipan. By midnight on June 18th, Nimitz informed Spruance that a Japanese vessel had broken radio silence and revealed its location at 355 miles southwest of the 58th's position. Still, Commanding Officer Vice Admiral Mark Mitcher believed the Japanese could be using a well-known deceptive tactic. Mitcher requested permission to move west overnight and position his task force for aerial assault in the morning. Concerned about a possible Japanese diversion to lure American forces away from the Marianas, Spruance declined Mitra's request. The crew was once again disappointed about the lack of action. Spruance was well known for his offensive tactics in the 1942 Battle of Midway, but he reckoned, quote, If we were doing something so important that we were attracting the enemy to us, we could afford to let him come and take care of him when he arrived. The Admiral's objective was clear. Protect the invading American fleet and secure the territory. Destroying the Japanese fleet was not a priority, but they were unaware of the enemy's plans to wage a frontal, decisive battle. Later that day, the U.S. Navy's sophisticated air control detected bombers flying their way and sent combat air patrol fighters to intercept them. Search patrols then took off from Task Force 58, and battleships and cruisers prepared to engage any attackers with destructive barrages of VT-fused anti-aircraft fire before they could reach the aircraft carriers. Four Raids At 5.50 a.m. on June 19th, Task Force 58 came across a Mitsubishi A6M0. 
The Japanese aircraft initiated an attack, but was quickly shot down. Still, it managed to radio the location of American presence before plunging into the Pacific. Soon after, U.S. forces spotted an enemy air formation coming their way. Thirty Grumman F-6F Hellcats were dispatched to meet the attackers at Orote Field, and a confrontation ensued. Even as the Japanese sent reinforcements from nearby islands, 35 enemy aircraft were destroyed against only one American Hellcat. Two hours later, the USS Albacore torpedoed by Admiral Ozawa's flagship, Taiho. Four torpedoes veered off course, and a fifth was about to hit the submarine when pilot Saiko Komatsu noticed the bubble path and immediately dived into it, causing a detonation. But despite the officer's sacrifice, a sixth and final torpedo hit the vessel's fuel tanks. Gas vapors began to fill the hangar decks as the Albacore fled with minor damage. The first raid of Japanese fighters came into radar contact at 10 a.m., 150 miles to the west from the 58th position. The task force sent every fighter at hand to meet them, and the 68 Japanese aircraft circled to regroup. It took them 10 costly minutes as the Hellcats intercepted them, and within minutes only 27 Japanese aircraft were left standing. Still, those who dodged the Hellcats attempted an attack on U.S. destroyers nearby. Only the USS South Dakota got hit by a bomb, but the impact wasn't enough to disable her. The South Dakota was the only American ship damaged during the battle. A second raid consisting of 107 fighters was met 60 miles out. 70 aircraft went down before reaching the American ships. But six broke through and attacked the Enterprise and Princeton carriers, resulting in some casualties but no serious harm. At noon, the USS Kavala prepared to attack the Shokaku carrier. Three out of six torpedoes hit the starboard. The aircraft aboard the carrier were refueling, and the torpedoes caused an explosion that set off more ammunition and bombs. Fuel vapors accumulated between the decks, finally blowing the ship apart. The Kavala escaped with minor damage. The American screen intercepted a third raid at 1 p.m., 50 miles from the north. Several attackers who managed to break through the defense tried unsuccessfully to hit American vessels. But this time, 40 out of 47 Japanese fighters returned safely to their carriers. A fourth raid was given an incorrect position for the Americans and could not find them, so they split into two groups and turned to Rota and Guam for refueling. The first group ran into an American task group and engaged in battle, losing half their numbers. Meanwhile, the second group was neutralized by 27 Hellcats while landing on Guam. Aboard the Japanese Taiho, an inexperienced officer attempted to ventilate the ship, but the vapors filled it up. A spark then ignited the fumes in the electric generator, triggering two series of explosions that sank the warship. On the first day of combat, the Japanese lost over 10 times more aircraft than the Americans. But the battle was not over, and Task Force 58 set sail to attack at dawn. Second day. After surviving the sinking of the Taiho carrier and boarding the Zuikaku, Vice Admiral Ozawa learned of the disastrous outcome of the previous day. He had only 150 aircraft at his disposal, but he believed there were many more still in Guam and Rota, and proceeded with the attack. Meanwhile, Task Force 58, along with patrols and midday Hellcat groups, were struggling to locate their opponents. At last, by 3.12 p.m., a search plane spotted a potential group of vessels. 32 minutes later, the sighting was verified. The Japanese fleet was 275 miles off and moving west at 20 knots. Vice Admiral Mitter ordered a full strike, even as daylight was fading. A message then came through. The Japanese location was off, and they were 60 miles farther than previously thought. The pilots would now be flying with minimal fuel and would have to return in the dark. A total of 95 Hellcat fighters, 54 Avenger torpedo bombers, and 77 dive bombers reached the Japanese forces before sunset and initiated an attack against a mere 35 enemy fighters. A strike group plunged directly into the Japanese oilers, damaging two of them severely. Bombers and torpedoes set the carrier Hayao on fire and sank it. Three other carriers and the battleship were also struck by bombs. Only 20 U.S. aircraft were destroyed, and the rest embarked on the return journey in the middle of the night. Their fuel levels were alarmingly low, and many were forced to ditch into the dark sea. In a last-ditch effort to help their fellow aviators, the entire American fleet shone searchlights into the sky and illuminated the scene at the risk of being spotted by enemy submarines or search planes. Even the destroyers fired star shells to assist. The total of 80 aircraft out of the returning group were lost. Search efforts were able to rescue about three quarters the following days. Aftermath After repeated defeats, Admiral Toyota ordered Ozawa to withdraw. The Japanese had suffered crippling losses, including three carriers and about 550 aircraft. In two days, 
the Americans had destroyed most of the forces that had taken almost a year to rebuild after the defeat in the Coral Sea. Nevertheless, the proud Imperial Japanese government hid the extent of the damage from the public. The Americans ended up losing about a hundred aircraft and no ships. Admiral Spruance's strategy had severely weakened the Japanese forces, and they would never recover from their losses. After the Battle of the Philippine Sea, the Japanese relied heavily on kamikaze pilots in a desperate attempt to reach peace terms rather than surrender. The battle would go down in history as the Great Marianas Turkey Shoot, after a Lexington pilot who exclaimed during one of the raids, quote, Hell, this is like an old-time turkey shoot. <laughs> 